This is Pest Now, Wood Destroying Insect, uh, course number three. It is mandatory that before you take this course, that you've taken Wood Destroying Insect course number one and Wood Destroying Insect course number two. This will be given to all inspectors, well, new hire and all existing inspectors if they had not had it. We did a great job of putting forth the Wood Destroying Insect requirements on, on the MPMA-33 form and the MD-1 form. However, we didn't do a really good job, it appears, on the actual inspection part of it. So this course will deal only with the inspections and what the requirements are. I advise you to pay particular attention to it and be prepared to take the exam at the end. A lot of this is what you may face if you're ever involved in a lawsuit uh, regarding wood destroying insect report. So this is good information. It's also mandatory by our, our attorneys have made us put this forward, so pay particular attention to it. I said we wouldn't go over a lot of what we had already learned, but I'm still gonna touch base on it. We all we know that the wood destroying insect report covers the insects that you're seeing here, but not moisture damage. Not in this state, the states that we work in. Those would be considered a WDO, wood destroying organism report. And at this time, the areas that we work in only require a wood destroying insect report. However, that may be listed in comments. Uh, it is not listed as infestation in the reports that we have on the wood destroying insect reports in Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, and the District of Columbia. Let's do just a little review on the reports that we're supposed to be using for these states. Washington, D.C., West Virginia, and Virginia all be reported real estate transactions as far as the wood destroying insect report on the MPMA-33 form. They're almost all similar between Maryland. Maryland has its own called the MD-1 form, and it's basically the same report except for a couple of sentences. I will tell you now that Maryland is a little more stricter. Virginia, D.C., and West Virginia have removed the section where it says a report of previous treatment. That's big. On Maryland, that sentence is still in there. So if there's evidence of previous treatment, it must be reported and it must be uh, identified. On the D on Virginia, D.C., and, and West Virginia, you don't. That has been removed. They're going to leave that up to the. Uh, a seller to notify them if any treatment has been done. Comar is the Code of Maryland re Regulations and they regulate how you actually perform inspections. Now all the states have something involved where they do uh, put out protocol where they want you to perform the inspection and how to do it, but Maryland is really tough. And I have found that using Maryland's, uh, what they'll, they'll refer to as Comar, do you follow Comar as far as inspection goes, I find that to be a pretty thorough uh, explanation of how pest control companies should perform their inspections. So we're going to adopt that. So whether you're working in DC, Virginia, or West Virginia, and they asked how you expect inspect the house, I don't expect you to tell them Comar, but I expect you to follow the Comar rules when it comes mostly to the inspections. It's a standard of inspections for pest inspections. Now a lot of it has to do with regulatory paperwork and stuff, but it also has to do with how you actually record it, how you actually test the wood. And when you're in front of an attorney and he's asking you a question, especially in Maryland, they'll ask you, would you explain Comar and what it applies to inspections for pests, specifically for wood destroying insect reports. And for instance, they'll ask you, how did you uh, sound the wood? I've sat in on several cases where the inspector was completely stumped. He didn't know what sounding the wood was. And that's kind of embarrassing. Thank God it wasn't our inspector. But we're going to follow Comar. There'll be a section in, our, in my website, uh, pestnowedu.com, where you can actually pull it up and refer to it, and there will be questions on it on the test. It does have limitations. So when, I'll explain the limitations in the course. So where Comar may require you to do something that physically is not possible to do, and if that is the case on your wood destroying insect report, for instance, uh, crawl space that you can't enter, you must explain why you can't enter, not only in the... Uh, the numbered section, you must explain to a little further why you couldn't get in it. Now, we've taught you everything there is to know pretty much about wood destroying insect reporting, the wood destroying insects, how it affects the house, the cell of the house, when it needs to be treated, when it does not need to be treated, how to identify damage, but we've never taught you how to actually inspect the house. And as much as I would think that this common sense, if you ask five different inspectors, they'll give you five different answers. So I'm going to put forth a pretty much suggested protocol. And if you follow this protocol, I've got 35 years in the industry and it has 
it, it, it has worked almost every time. If you follow a certain pattern, you won't go wrong. I believe that most inspectors today go in and out of a house not realizing the liability or the importance of that inspection, especially to the company and to the people that's buying that house. Many lawsuits occur from it all over the nation. That's why most companies don't like doing these reports and inspections. But for us, we raise the bar, we do them, it's our livelihood. What the hell? All right, here's where it kind of picks up a little bit. And this is where I said, inspecting a house is really common sense. See, it's not, it's not at all. As a matter of fact, even the simplest things that I've run up against in the last month and some of our other managers, it's just, it's mind boggling. Uh, I'll give you an example. This is where we'll start the inspection from. Last month or this month, we probably gotten five calls where the realtor or the seller or even the buyer that was there to meet for the inspection said the inspector simply walked in, did not do a greeting, did not even identify himself, did the inspection and left without selling the word, saying the word. What the hell? I mean, I don't know where that come from. I don't know what's going on. Maybe we're too used to doing uh, lockbox houses. But anyway, you got to you gotta introduce yourself. My old buddy, Joe Mo here. He goes up to the house, sticks his hand out, identifies himself as a pest professional. I'm going to do the wood destroying insect on your report on your house uh, for settlement. Regardless of the buyer to sell, you're going to induce yourself. Hey, I'm not really crazy about his haircut, but uh, nonetheless, he's got a presentable attitude. He looks clean. He's going to do an inspection, and I'm confident with it. I'm going to give you some advice, though. We're in a different world now. Don't stick your nasty little hand out there to shake with all those germs on it. People don't want you touching them today, especially with the viruses and everything going on. It's probably not good for you either. You know what? I was a police officer for a long time, and I can't tell you any time I ever shook anybody's hand. I was always nice and polite, but I'm not shake, I'm not a handshaker, okay? So I really don't, I don't even like to go to the barbershop for that matter. So anyway, don't reach your hand out. Let me give you a better idea. Identify yourself. If you have a business card, fine. Stick it, to, you know, give it to them. And even I ain't real fond of that. To be honest with you, it kind of identifies yourself as well, maybe a salesman too much. You're, a, you're an inspector. And you know what else more than that? You're an investigator. That's where we're missing it. When you inspect a, a house, you're investigating to see for that potential buyer or that lender if there's any potential problems that are going to harm that house, whoever's lending money on it or buying that house. That's what you're there for. So be professional. Be polite. I don't want you going in there commenting on pictures. Is that your kids? And oh, why did y'all live in South? They don't want to hear that. Do your job, but be professional and by all means, greet yourself, greet them and identify yourself. Here's the other thing that drove me nuts. They reported on several occasions that our inspector, when they finished the inspection, just walked out of the house. Never said hi, bye, kiss my butt. Uh, I found a problem, didn't find a problem. And then lo and behold, a couple hours later, they received a report saying there's a problem there. I have no clue where that came from, but like I said, it ain't common sense. So we're going to go over this and teach you how to treat it. First thing is be able to greet the customer. Well, that's not the first thing, but when you go to the door, that's the first thing. So let's go over really what's the best way to do this stuff. All right. You've had courses one, two, and three. So you know what we're looking for either be carpenter bees, carpenter ants, termites, or wood-boring beetles. So you'd know what we're looking for. Now we want to know how actually is the best way to inspect that house. What is the best way to start and to finish it? And if you ask five different inspectors, they'll give you five different answers. So what I've always done is find a rule to be consistent. I went through a lot of uh, detective schools in the military and also in the uh, civilian police department as a detective. And they, they teach crime scene inspections. And it's it's critical that you get this right because one little mess up at a crime scene could destroy an entire case. Well, to me, you say, well, that's not as important. Yes, it is. These people are buying a half a million dollar to three to five million dollar homes in our area. And the liability of the company is significant, not only to them, but to you. So it's pretty damn important that we treat it with the same respect and also with the same uh, sense of urgency so I, I have developed an, an, a way that I do it that I suggest that you probably follow it and I'll give you my tips on it. Because if you ever get confronted with an attorney, they're going to ask you, explain to me how you inspect a house, every house. And if you say, well, they're different. Well, they are different. But how are they different? Be prepared to answer that. Here's what I get to questions at a lot. They will ask me during a deposition or either in a case or I've heard them ask the other uh, inspectors for the other companies and they'll say, 
explain how, how much time does it take to inspect a home? And I'm thinking to myself, you absolutely know nothing about the industry. You wouldn't ask that question. I realize it's important to your case to try to prove guilt or not guilt, but there's so many variables and that's why you need to be aware of them too. Cause one day, hopefully uh, you won't have to be asked that, but you may, let's take a look at it. How long does it take to inspect a home for wood destroying insects? Remember these realtors and customers are used to home inspectors that are in there for four and five hours looking at everything in the house. They, you know, the uh, HVAC system, the refrigerators, the washing machines, the uh, diaper dispensers or whatever. They got to inspect everything. We don't, we're only concentrating on wood destroying insects in, in on or under the structure. So let's look at the different scenarios we run into. And they ask me, how long does it take it? I'll ask them, I'll say, well, does it have a garage or no garage? Is the garage attached or detached? Is it a full basement or is it a crawl space? Or maybe it's on a slab. We know they do have split levels where it's finished on both levels or maybe a crawl space under it. Is the house vacant or is it occupied? Is it finished or unfinished as far as the basements go? There's a lot of variables that expect how much that, that will uh, affect timing. And, and if you don't not prepared to answer that and explain why there are different variables in times and he's got you over a barrel and that's their job to get you that way. Townhouse is the same way. Well, you know, DC to call road houses and our areas now here, they're called townhouses. It doesn't matter. They're still single family. They're not single family homes. They're still homes. They're just got another home living beside of them. So, you know, townhouses. So, but it's still, they either have a garage or no garage. Uh, and even they have attached and detached garage, full basements and split levels of crawl spaces. I mean, vacant, unfinished, occupied, not occupied, same variables. So how long does it take? To inspect that condos that depends on one floor first floor second floor third floor occupied unoccupied you, you follow me on this right but the real variable square footage if you ask me how long it takes to inspect a fully occupied uh not a uh, home in middleburg that's 7,000 square feet that well, may take a little while but if you ask me how long does it take to inspect a home in silver spring which is 1,100 square feet, well, it may not. And then it has the other variables involved there. So be prepared to answer that. There is no, what I'm getting at, there's no magic to the numbers. It all goes by the square footage, the size of what we're inspecting. So be aware of that. I will tell you this, if you're in and out of the house, no matter what it is in four minutes, you'd probably, uh, probably have uh, caused yourself a lot of pain. All right, tools of the trade. This is where kind of uh, is an open it's an open book because the, the pest industry is typically a a gadget industry and it shouldn't be, but it is. And on all sides, the manufacturers are trying to sell different tools and different uh, products. And if it all comes back to normally your basic tools, one of the basic tools you have to have is a big screwdriver. Sounds crazy, but it's true. A big screwdriver is going to enable you to be able to reach things you normally couldn't reach, like drop ceilings and put it open. It's going to be able to help you probe a little bit. It's basically your own little probing tool, but it also could be a sounding tool, which I found not a lot of people are doing nowadays. You need to sound the wood. If the wood doesn't look right, you need to sound it. If it sounds hollow, you do it long enough, you'll understand if the wood is, is, is sounding like it's hollow or there's a problem beneath it, or it's a good old strong piece of wood uh, when you're doing it, because paint will mask damages. Uh, we'll go into that in a minute. So a good screwdriver works pretty darn good. That's essential. You got to have that. The other thing is a big flashlight. When I mean big, I don't mean humongous like this. I mean, it's got to be bright. Today, we we issue our people the best flashlights on the market. They actually are so powerful that they'll burn a hole in the, ass in the upholstery of a truck if you leave it in there and on too long. Uh, these little D-cell batteries, uh, uh, Mickey McDonald's things, uh, yellow looking things. That take, don't, man, don't do that. You're, it's totally unprofessional. Give yourself a good one. And by the way, sticking it in your back pocket, dude, what are you doing? Get yourself a flashlight holder. Look professional. I mean, somebody comes in there with a screwdriver and a flashlight in their back pocket. I am not going to have too much confidence in that guy. How many of you do that? Have a little bit more thought of process on what you're doing with that. Now, there's a lot of things that a lot of people add to it. Uh, a lot of people carry moisture meters uh, to detect moisture in the wood. They you know, home inspectors do it, but I know a lot of termite inspectors that do it. Uh, sniff dogs. I've worked with two companies that had uh, termite detection dogs. Now they have bed bug detection dogs. I'm going to give you an issue with this in a second now, okay? And also there's all type of 
gadgets out there now that will detect carbon dioxide or whatever other byproducts a, su a subterranean termite may put off. And uh, infrared lighting or whatever to detect coolness and uh, heat inside a wall to detect moisture damage. There's a problem with the last four I just gave you. Those are assumptions. Because a dog alerts on a wall doesn't mean there's termites in there. It could be. They're, they're okay, effective sometimes. But on a wood destroying insect report, you're reporting real evidence in real time. You can't report assumptions. What if that dog alerts on a wall? The buyer suggests you tear the wall down, or so the homeowner tears the wall down, and there's nothing there. They had termites there maybe a couple of years ago and left one termite tube and they scraped it off. You just cost the sale of that house on assumption. These other detections and gadgets and gadgets are nothing but liability. There's no x-ray machine today to fit a house. You go in, you inspect a house with the tools that are going to give you correct evidence. Now, if they call you in a homeowner to do a pre-inspection, all those tools would be great. You can give them what you think is, what the assumptions are. But on a wood destroying insect official report, you go with what it is. They're all assumptions except for that flashlight, your set of eyeballs, experience, and then that screwdriver. The best tool in this industry is experience and training. We give our employees a parking spot when they earn 20 years with the company. It's gotten so crazy that the entire parking lot is full of 20 year employee signs. There's nowhere to park. That's a good thing. You can't replace experience. Training, love it or hate it, most people hate it. We train every month. Some of you employees watching this right now hate it. But you know what? That's what's going to protect us and make us better. And that's not what professionals do. They train constantly. So get used to it. One of the things that I was watching, because I do a lot of research on this, is uh, how other companies, especially in other countries, uh, inspect for termites. This was really interesting. Actually, I fell in love with it. This is a, called a sounding tool. Remember the word sounding? Well, this guy had taken a golf club shaved the head off of it and put a small aluminum mallet on it and he taps the wall and it's an experienced inspector this way he's able to determine just by the sound of it you don't have to have ears like his guy on the right but you can hear if wood is compromised by tapping on it a lot of times you get used to it so once you find that the wood is compromised then you can do more investigating remember i told you you're an investigator as much as an inspector i know of one case where the Baseboard looked great all the way around the house. The homeowner came in and kicked it and it fell apart. It was nothing but paint. A simple sounding would have worked on that. So you have to sound as you go. Screwdriver is not usually the best tool for it because of the pointed edge. And even if you use the other end of it, still not that effective. You don't get that sound from it. But I, this is a valuable tool. And I'm going, man, what I have to do is get all our guys to get golf clubs and shave the head off. No. Believe it or not, I found them on Walmart. Detection hammer test. All it is is a sounding device, $10. I would not, if I was in a field inspecting today, that would be in my belt. I, I care utility belt, but that would be in my belt. The other thing that I use that is invaluable is a mechanics mirror. I cannot tell you how many problems I have found with a mechanics mirror, simply because it extends your, extends your hand uh, height and it extends your sight. You're able to see things that you normally can't see. And termite inspectors don't carry ladders. But home, home inspectors carry ladders, we don't. Because we're only working from the ground up. But the sill plate, the unfinished basement, is either on an eight foot wall or a nine foot wall. Your, your eyes aren't going to see that. And most of the termite entrances come in from the ground to the sill plate areas you learned in your other courses. So this thing has been an invaluable tool to us. And a lot of damages are missed, unfortunately, because people don't carry that. Um, at one time, uh, we had a company buy everybody mechanics mirrors, and with probably three weeks, they were all lost. You as a professional, you need to take care of that. I never had anybody buy mine because I was afraid of missing damages. And also, remember, more than likely, they're gonna, if you're a professional and do it right, they're going to take the treatment from you. This is something I carried personal, but I don't expect you guys to, but i tell you what I carried it for. That's a hacksaw blade, uh, probably 18 inches. And what I did is I put uh, black tape around it as a handle. And I didn't carry it in the house with me unless I saw a need in it. And we'll get to why that is so valuable in a minute. Because remember, a hacksaw blade is very thin and it's pliable, it's maneuverable. And there are certain cases that prove it's invaluable. Now, remember what I said about sounding? 
uh, what I said about Comar, Comar Section B, standards for inspection of pests, sound or probe readily accessible structural members to inspect for wood destroying insects. So when that attorney asked one of the inspectors, uh, did you sound the wood? And they gave a dumbfound look on it. What's right there? And he had already said, did you understand Comar? Do you inspect for Comar? Yes. Did you sound the wood or what sounded? Hmm, not good. Don't don't be that guy or girl. All right, let, let's put this little mechanics mirror to use here. And, and I, I hope I convince somebody because this is nuts not to. You're in an unfinished basement. You got the seal plate running on top with a floor joist set on. Uh, that's clearly, you're not, if you stand on a bucket and you know, we got people tripping over curbs and stuff and breaking their legs. I don't want them standing on a bucket downstairs or borrowing a customer's ladder where the the mechanics mirror would be perfect for this. And I don't really don't understand why no one uses it. I hope they use it, but I know they don't. Anyway, use a mechanics mirror. It's going to extend your sight. It's going to extend your uh, line of sight and also your reach. And uh, where termites normally enter, and that's the area. We all know that from the previous training that we've had. The band board is the flat board faced in, the sill place, the one on the bottom. Well, termites follow that, but it's on the other side of the wood where the ground is. So you're not gonna see that with the naked eye. A mechanics mirror will pick that right up. And with a long screwdriver, if there's insulation between the uh, joists, you just pull that little insulation out and take a peep. It, I promise you, it's there. You just have to look and it's, it's criminal not to report it and not to look for it. So it depends on how bad you want to see it. Now, there's other areas that we can look at that I think will be helpful and I'll give you some advice on how to actually how to reach it. Let me give you a demonstration here. Hopefully this will get through it. There's your inspector inside the um, inside the structure. He's got an eight foot or a 10 foot or a nine foot wall there. Of course you can't see uh, where the sill plate and the uh, uh, band board is. And where did I tell you that the termites always go? Here's the illustration of it blown up. You got the front stoop there, termites nesting in the soil. They enter through the cracks that come up. They get right in that corner right there. And that's where you're gonna find the problem. The mechanics mirror will pick that up. <laughs> Unless you're a giraffe, you're not gonna be able to see that. So you, th this, is, this, is, this is criminal not to use it, in my opinion. When I came out of the uh, investigators or police department, I entered the uh, pest industry. So it was only natural that I used what was available to me. So I approached every house pretty much after doing it for so many years, like a crime scene. And I found out that it, it actually was a big advantage because I was used to approaching houses and doing proper uh, paperwork and also proper investigative tools to see what had happened before and after it's a big help. I'll explain to you how I do it. I think it will help with you, but I want you to approach every house just like it's a crime scene to a degree because in a way you are. Uh, your findings will mean the difference of uh, half a million dollar to a $3 million mistake or worse yet, a lawsuit, which could be $60 million. Who knows? So it's very important on what you're doing on this. You know, as a, as a road officer or a detective, no matter what role I was in, even as a when I became a uh, pest inspector, I approached every house the same way. And it doesn't mean when I drove up to the house. If I got a call dispatched to a house, oh, normally the dispatcher would advise me if there had been previous history there, if there had been previous problems there. Uh, when I got into the pest industry, before I went to a house, I would look in our files to see if we had history of the house. Our system is the same way. If we've ever been to a house, and we've been to a lot of them, uh, you can look it up on, our, on your tablets you carry and you'll see what well, we were there in 19, I mean 2002 and find out what the problems are. So you get a little background of the house. If it's a house that we've never been to, then you're gonna go off of you know, your gut. Now, once you pull up at a house like this, uh, police lady pulling up here, same way as I do, is that we, when I'm pulling up, I'm looking at everything. I'm looking at anything that could cause uh, a potential problem or concern to me as a police officer. Well, when I pull up as a pest inspector, I'm looking at anything that could be a potential problem uh, while I'm inspecting the house, and I don't mean by hurting me, but I mean by what could cause a wood destroying insect problem in that house. And that starts by building what we call a 360. I'll walk up, I'll look at the scene and I'll do a three, I'll look all the way around before I'll even take the first step in to get a good bird's eye view of it. Today they do photographs and crime scenes, which calls 360, but we're not going that far. So what we'll do is we'll pull up, I'm looking at the house to see what the house will present as far as wood destroying insects. Now, if every house looked like the one on the right, well, it's obvious. Uh, no brainer. I mean, a house is falling down. It's got, it's got all kind of damage to it. But the problem is, 
houses we go to don't look like that. They look like this. And the potential problems in that house are hidden at best. Sometimes they're obvious, but they're not like the ones here. So your inspection starts as soon as you pull up, actually before because you pulled a history on it. Once you pull up, you're gonna notice things. I'll, I will always note the conditions, the weather, the elements. What Remember, wood destroying insects are drawn to moisture and also to poorly kept areas. So I'm gonna be looking at any areas before I even go up. And you think, well, you take that much time? Well, yeah, I mean, that's, how do you, yes, you should take that much time on every house. It doesn't take that long. You pull up, you start observing as soon as you pull up. I want to make a mental note of anything that I've got in my mind. And back in the day, I carried a clipboard and I'd write it down. I would notice that there's a negative grade water flowing back to the house in the backyard. If I'm looking at the front of the house and I see this negative grade, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm, I'm noting that, you know what, there might be a moisture problem in the back of that house. What comes with moisture? We're destroying insects. So I've got, a, I've, got a, I've got a situation there that I might can take advantage of and expose it because I don't want the new buyer getting it, all right? So negative grade's always something to look at. Even flat grade, you want to notice. This is an example of flat grade where the grade just, the water just sits there and it's seeping down into the soil. doesn't have a way to escape. And normally there's always going to be a moisture problem there or it's going to be a wet area. And again, wet areas draw a termite. Also, excessive foliage around the structure. This is extreme. I get it. But it, I've worked homes in Bethesda, an area where it had that type of vine and foliage all over the house. I can assure you, nine times out of ten, that house has carpenter ants because of the conditions underneath it. It, it, it it's just an attractant. It's just an avenue of uh, of the insects to uh, progress to get in there. So automatically, I'm looking at that. I'm forming an opinion, but I'm not, I haven't finalized it until I found actual evidence. But it gives me something to look for. Remember, you're investigating, not just inspecting. All right, moisture conditions or damage. I know you guys walk right by that. I know that, our girls. That's why you sound that wood. Let me give you a little situation here. If you sound that wood or even probe a little bit, you haven't destroyed the wood. Oh, you tore the wood up. No, that wood's already tore up. Moisture tore that wood or something tore that wood up. And good probability it's moisture and some type of wood destroying insects. So you didn't destroy it, but you're allowed to delicately probe it and to sound it. You walk right by that and they say, well, we couldn't see it. It was painted over. No, you have a responsibility to sound it. That's why that attorney asked, did you sound the wood? Well, it was painted over. Did you sound the wood? You can still sound, you sound that wood, you know there's a problem under there. You have to find out what it is. Actual insect activity. When you see this, carpenter ants love moist wood. They're going to go to it every time and also termites. You might even see the actual insects. Pet peeve, man. No one looks up anymore. Carpenter, I mean, carpenter bees are crazy in our areas. In this case, I believe Ray Charles could see that. But the, because of the, the woodpecker's damage has been done there. But a lot of times the damage and the ex entry holes and exit holes are on the other side of the board, which you don't see. Wall to ground contact issue. This is a situation here where actually the aluminum siding isn't you know, really on the ground, but it's so close and you have a negative grade here where the, the water's coming off the building and just sitting there. You got a moist area there, and it would not be surprised if I didn't look between that gap there, uh, between the siding and the ground, and find termite tubes. It'd be, I see them all the time in those areas, and I think sometimes you might walk by it, which I hope you wouldn't. Tree or brush to, uh, uh, covering a house. When you walk up to a house, uh, I, I, you pull up the house like this, I promise you, you, you should be thinking. Uh, carpenter ants galore and if it's on a regular inspection I'm thinking they got to have animals in there they got all kind of things now I know I'm doing a wood destroying insect report but that type of situation lends itself so well to moisture damage and moisture damage and moisture conditions create wood destroying insect problems and damage evidence of previous treatment now I you remember I told you that in Virginia and DC and West Virginia you don't have to report evidence of previous damage well, you may not have to report it, but you have to note it. Because if you understand that people just don't wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and say, you know what, I think I'll get a $1,500 termite job today and have them drill my front stoop, or my garage in that case. No, they were treated for a reason. Now, I'm going to investigate those areas to see if there's any evidence that they may have returned or if there's still damage there. A lot of times people will have a house treated 15 years ago, but never repair the damage. Or treated 15 years ago and the termites came back. So you, even though you don't report it in those states, 
In Maryland, you better report it. But in those states where you don't have to report it, you better note it as an investigator. Recent repair. This is killer, man. You've got to really be a student of the game here. This may be what it looks like, but that's what it looked like before they put the house up for sale. And how would you know that? There's ways that you can tell if you just look a little closer. But if you see something that just doesn't look right, the paint's a different color than the other side of it, investigate it. Find out why it was changed. Now, all that I talked about was on the outside of the house before I ever went in. Because I want to get my uh, footnotes in place and form a little game plan to figure out areas that I might be suspicious of that I can look. But when you walk up to that front door before you do your Joe Mo greeting, what I want you to do is be suspicious. First thing, heck, look down. If you see moisture damage like this, remember, perception. I'm perceiving that to be a problem. I'm not going to call it, but I'm going to investigate it. I would take a small mechanics mirror, shine my light, and look up inside that wood. I might probe it a little bit. I definitely would sound it. Because whether it's moisture damage or insect damage, I need to know. You can't just walk by there and go, moisture damage, I couldn't see it. Well, you're going to have to, did you sound it? Did you probe it? Don't be the guy sitting in that seat with the attorney challenge you. I can't tell you how many times I've walked into a house and saw a throw rug, and I just moved the throw rug a little bit and see that. I can't tell you how many times I've been as a manager to a house investigating a damage claim, and the hardwood's a little dark in one area, and it is in another area, and it got termite damage, and it's clearly they had a rug air. Well, it was covered up. Well, you know you can get by with that, but guess what's going to happen? Still going to go to court, still going to pay thousands of dollars, and then they're going to settle, and it doesn't matter when all you had to do was move the throw rug or at least be suspicious of it. All right, now we're in the house. What do we do? Well, there's a couple ways that I approach it. Remember, as I'm in the house, I've already got my game plan. I've seen what I've seen on the outside, and that can change while I'm in there. Condos, you pretty much, that's pretty simple, cut and dry. Yeah, usually condos are one level almost always, and you're going to do second floor, first floor, third, whatever floor the condo specific is on, you don't have much of a chance there. I have found problems with them, even on the top floor, uh, but they're rare, but you still have to do the inspection. you got to put time in. And again, how long does it take? There's a lot of variables. Was it people in there? Was it vacant? I mean, furniture. So you still got to do it. You can do those any way you want, but I start at the front door. I always move to my right, walk myself around, and I'll check panel boxes. I check everything just just to make sure that I'm not, and don't, don't assume that because it's a condo, you don't have to do it. That, that's not happening. All right. Homes with basements, whether they're finished or unfinished, and home with split level. I inspect them the same way. I always start from the bottom up. I've already done my outside as far as a quick look. I haven't done the full outside, but I did a quick look on the outside. I'll go, I'll be cordial, you know, greet the people. I don't want to make friends with them, but I don't want to be unpleasant, but I'll let them know what I'm there for. And uh, every now and then I'll ask the question, you know, have you ever had a problem here or there or whatever? But I'll always go from the bottom up, all the way up to the attic, and I will enter the attic under certain circumstances if it's a pull down. And I will take a photograph of it. I don't want you to be in a photography company like some complain of. I don't want your little fingers to wear out, but you will take photographs because it's going to protect you. That's what you do. These type of homes, you go from the bottom up. Home on slab. I'm a little different here. Here, I'll start from the very top and go down. I'll walk straight upstairs on a home on slab. I will inspect the, inspect the attic if I can inspect it and work my way down all the way to the lower floor and then the garage and then the outside, even though I've already done a lot of the outside. All right, getting to the hell holes now. Crawl spaces. Nobody likes to inspect crawl spaces, but that is if you got problems, that's where they're going to be. So here's how you do a crawl space. Do not do the crawl space first and then walk in the home dragging your nasty little dirt with you. You want to do the crawl space at the very end so you don't dirty up the house when you're doing inspection upstairs. Uh, I, 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 well, I'm not going to go into it, but we paid for a lot of rugs where people track mud in a house. Do the crawl space last because uh, most of you don't have uh, crawl suits, so you're just filthy when you get out of there and you don't you go straight in the house. So make sure you do the crawl space last and pay for listen. You inspect every inch of their crawl space because if you miss damages, that's more than likely where you're going to miss it at. Now we know how to enter the house, how to inspect it. I'm going to give you some tips on what normally catches you. So I want you to keep your eyes open because every house has little monsters in it. You miss them little monsters or you walk by it. 
uh, something else happens that catches your attention, or you prosecute too early on something you shouldn't be, you're going to have major issues. So I'm going to give you some tips. When you see any inconsistencies with wood, question it, sound it, probe it. You see something like this, remember, termites don't eat paint. They'll leave the paint there and ain't nothing behind it. So if you probe, not probe, but if you sound that particular wood there at the quarter round, a baseboard, a lot of times it'll just cave in on you. And But you, a lot of times if you don't sound it, you'll walk right by it. When you see this, I, I'm going to give homeowners the benefit of the doubt. They're not really pest control or termite or wood destroying insect inspect uh, uh, experts. Maybe they don't know that that wood's compromised or damaged by termites, but they're getting a house ready for sale. Either way, they want it to look presentable, so they'll paint over it. And homeowners or do-it-yourselfers, they're not really good at this, so they are always leave inconsistencies in the uh, their finished work. You see that, what do you have to do? Sound it. If you walk by that and there's damages under there, and you're going to rely on an excuse, I couldn't see it was painted over, you're going to lose because you didn't sound the wood. If you sound that wood and it sounds hollow, you can then gently probe it. That's going to prove your case. By not doing it, you're going to be liable. The old throw rug, can't tell you how many times I got burned on that. Not me personally. <laughs> but always be suspicious. That's what's behind it. You know what? I said Ray Charles could see this. No disrespect for anybody but sight problems. I use it as a, probably shouldn't use it to pun, but the fact is, anyone can see this that can see. The problem is, and where we miss it, these little devils, carpenter bees, they're smart little slick dudes. They go behind the wood, drill their holes, and go in. What gives them away is the spittle. Now, if you see that, it's automatically called. You don't see the drill holes of where they've been into the wood, but you know they're there because of the spittle. Take advantage of your experience and what you've been taught. And don't walk past that. And look up. All right. I'm going to get into the area of focus here now. I've already told you what to look out for. Now we're going to focus on certain things. Because if you don't focus on it, somebody's going to focus on you and it won't be in a good light. You've learned that most of the problems with subterranean termites occur under the front stoop and you know the reasons why, because you've already had course one and two by brilliant instructor. And I know he wouldn't miss telling you that. So you make sure those are areas of focus that you always check. When you see this, th that somehow that beam got compromised. Normally it's through moisture damage or through termite or, or, or wood bores. The fact that it's like this, and if it's insect damage, you must report it as damaged. Even if it's repaired, that it must be insect damage, whatever insect is, repaired in the past by others. And we're not structural engineers. I can't tell you if that's repaired right or not, but you're going to report that it was there. And if it is uh, evidence of whatever wood destroying insect, you have to list it because you're looking for evidence of. It doesn't have to be live. Term. You know this from the other uh, classes. So look there. I see that. Guess what? Those people might just had that repa repaired and never did a treatment. So they're going to have to show me some treatment evidence. Remember what I told you about the old hacksaw trick? This is the old hacksaw trick. Termites love double joists and triple joists. They get right up in between them. They're sneaky little devils. They don't want nobody to see them. And they'll tunnel in there and cause damages and you'll never see them. But the old hacksaw blade pulls them right out. You take that hacksaw blade running up in there. A lot of times you'll see the white work, I mean, the white worker termites and even soldiers uh, appearing and you'll see damages. If it's just mud stuck in there, you'll identify that too, which will do, you know, stop your uh, from having to make the call. But this has saved me a lot of times. Something so simple. I don't have to have an animal sniffing at it. I don't have to have some kind of electronic robot up there walking around on it. A little hacksaw blade will save you every time. I get asked a lot of times about drop ceilings. Do you open every, it's a trick by attorneys. Do you, do you, is your protocol to look into every drop ceiling? No, it is not. Drop ceilings, I would, our protocol would be that in vulnerable areas where we know there could be evidence of termites or if other conditions exist to make us suspect, we'll pop drop ceilings. Some drop ceilings, when you pop them, don't go together, right? Or you break them. And we're not supposed to move or push any object to the point of uh, it's going to injure it. But if there is conditions under the front stoop, you're going to have to look. 
If it's under areas where termite activity is suspected, you're gonna to have to look. If you see moisture problems associated like this drop ceiling, you're gonna to have to look. That's gotta come up. You're gonna to have to see what's on there because what does moisture damage create most of the time? Or moisture problems? We're destroying insects. On the top picture, there again, you've got a compromised, looks like a window frame. And if you walk by there and say, well, I couldn't tell what it is. Did you sound it? Did you probe it? Just saying it's painted over will not save you. You actually have to sound that wood. So those are problems that you, know, you need to focus on. Drill marks and evidence of previous treatment. Maryland, nope, don't have to report it, but you're darn sure better use it as your thinking of what could have happened, what caused these people to treat this. It was their damages before. And then if, they're, if the homeowners are there, ask them, what, what did you treat, treat it for? And, you know, it, it's, I'm not going to call infestation if I don't see anything, but I bet if you look further, they didn't just wake up and say, I want a termite treatment. All right, the focus lately has been on addicts because we've had a lot of issues with addicts and problems not found with addicts. Uh, us reporting that there's no access when there is a pull down. So let me reiterate that you have to inspect all levels of the home. If the attic has a pull down access, you must enter the attic. If it has a walkway and it's safe to walk in that attic, you must inspect the attic. Attics if require a ladder. We don't carry ladders. So if there's an attic that just has the hatch like in the bottom right hand corner you have to list number 11 and you have to list no ladder in the obstruction section if you do not list no ladder you it's a violation not only with me but with the state attics that have walkways and can be inspected safely inspect them if you have to walk around there and juggle around on, on floor on roof joists uh, rafters no that's unsafe but listed on the WDI why it was limited access because it's unsafe conditions. The requirements now for pest now is all attic entrances must be photographed and downloaded with the file. If you think that's too much work for you, if you're afraid to walk up a flight of steps, I suggest you buy a Peloton, get in better shape, or maybe start working at Dairy Queen where you only have to walk in one door, not up steps. So why all the interest in attics? What has caused it? But you know what? It's, it hasn't caused it. It's always been there. But you have to be able to record any evidence that's going to protect you later in life as far as a professional on being sued. And here's a case where it didn't. It worked right against. This is an actual case. Mandatory. Requirement on all WDIs. This is what this case spurred this on. Photo of all attic entrances must be photographed. If no attic entrance, it must be recorded. No attic. That's on a WDI. If pull down, you must inspect if safe. If no pull down, but an attic hatch and a ladder is required, number 11 and spell out no ladder. This is an actual house by Pest Now. This taught us a lot of lessons. This is a slab home that we inspected and we did record a swarmer termite on the inside and a termite tube, I believe, on the outside. When the homeowner bought the house, the main ceiling frame caved in on him when he walked in. So he pulled the walls down and there was not a single piece of timber in that house that was not destroyed by termites. I don't even know how it was standing. This is a dining, in the dining room, the main raft of the house fell through the roof, completely destroyed by termites. If someone says they don't think termites can do a lot of damage, I'm not gonna save that picture. The house was complete. And you know what? The walls on the lower level were pristine. You couldn't tell they had termites in there. So basically the inspector that did the inspection on his house could have been protected. There was no evidence to speak of damage in that house. When he did the WDI, he listed the proper stuff, but he listed attic 11, no ladder, which meant it was a hatch and he couldn't get any attic. When I went there, that's me as a young man, pulling down a pull down attic. One of our other managers was taking his picture and behind me is their attorney. It had a pull down access. And when you walked up that access, lo and behold, 
extensive termite tubes and damage clearly visible. Had the inspector went in the attic, he would have seen every bit of that. Condemnable house, totally condemnable. One of our largest payouts on missed damages, not to count the lost confidence. What we learned from that, that's why the emphasis on attics is so clear. Don't be that guy. Crawl spaces are pure hell. When I got in the industry from being a cop, I can tell you right now, I hated them worse than anything. But I was so afraid that I would miss damages or get caught uh, doing something by not entering it that I, I just had a fear I had to enter it if it was safe. Uh, the first company I worked for made you put your business card in the back corner, uh, tack it to the uh, uh, floor joist. And I've been into the same house three years from then and other people have done it and I found their, their cards in there. So, you know, I don't require people doing that, but you better crawl space if you're going to make a mistake. That's where it's going to be. They're nasty. If it's unsafe conditions, I don't want you to go in there, but it, it has to be fully inspected if it's not, if it's safe. Now, if there's standing water, there's electrical, it's unsafe. Don't go in there. If it looks like this one, I might consider that unsafe. Uh, there are exceptions. As I said, unsafe conditions, height limitations. Don't do that. <laughs> I mean, if you're a big fat wampus cat and you look at that, that inspection thing and you can't get in it, there's probably somebody a little thinner than you that could probably get in it. So you can't hide behind that. I was on a recent legal claim and their expert witness uh, with the termite industry crawled around a crawl space like a little snake. And we said there were height limitations and couldn't get in. Well, the guy that was doing the inspection weighed about 250 pounds. In that case, you have to do not complete the inspection, have a smaller inspector get in there and get it. I don't require everybody to go on a, a diet because I'm a fat man myself, but you better get somebody in there to complete that inspection and don't just say you couldn't get in it. High liability inspections, that's one of the worst ones is crawl spaces. Thankfully, our problem hasn't been lately crawl spaces, it's been attics but you still have to document any problems with it, especially if you can't get in it. Other than attics, one of the problems we've always had, and I'm always having to defend it, is damages will be missed in certain areas, especially garages, and or certain areas of the basement. And our inspector will do the right thing. He listed clutter conditions on the, uh, on the, on the WDI report, but that's word of mouth. And by the time it goes to court, they're, they're claiming that it wasn't cluttered, that it was actually vacant. And in some cases, we were able to prove them wrong through actual real estate pictures. In other cases, we could not prove it. So to stop that and to protect you as an inspector and us as a company and the buyer, if there's clutter conditions, it must be photographed and downloaded with the WDI. If you list clutter conditions and don't have a, a, a photograph of those clutter conditions, you will be in violation because you're not protecting yourself you're not protecting the company and you're not protecting the buyer. Forensics. Good detectives don't go in on a murder scene and claim evidence that hadn't been photographed. If there's evidence there, whether it's wood destroying insects that you're photographing as evidence, you better photograph the conditions that are in that house too. They're gonna to cause you complications. All done. Yep. Yeah, you're done. The problem with being all done is you just walk out of the house, don't say anything to anybody. You don't make the phone call. You don't do your report. Why even do the job? It drives me crazy. So if realtors or buyers or sellers are present, advise them you have completed your inspection. Man, why wouldn't you do that? Just walk out of the house. That's crazy. Advise them your findings. Do not attempt to sell the treatment. You're an inspector. You're an investigator. You're not a salesman. I'll explain that. Don't get crazy. Do not engage in trying to prove your findings. A homeowner might say, oh, that's not active. Realtor, that's not active. It is not your job to defend the reports or the requirements of the report. Ma'am, sir, I'm just a reporting agent. This is the report. I will explain to you later what's going on, but right now I have to report this. And you do. You've got to report it. It doesn't matter what they say. It matters what you report. And you know, just be as cordial about it as you can. Do not tell them it has to be treated. There is no law. A wood destroying insect problem has to be treated. Nothing tells them they have to. 
it's a lender issue. If the lender requires it, then if they want the loan, the lender will tell them they have to do it. Not you, not the state of Maryland, not the Catholic Church. Nobody's got to tell them they got to do it. It's the lender that's going to do it. So there's no law, so don't tell them they have to do it. Ask, this is a, an inspector of ours does this. It's a really cool way to do it. No, everybody wants a back door. So if you tell them they got a problem, they're going to be co confronted to you or combative to you. So what he does, he said, look, I found a problem in here. And uh, by the way, if you're under warranty with a certain company, I suggest you give them a call because it may be under warranty or at least they have some documentation on it. But I'd give them a call first. If you go in and trying to sell that and prove your case, you're a salesman, you're going to lose. Do it that way because guess what? They're going to call you back and say, hey, uh, Inspector Mo, yeah, they, you know what? They thought they were under warranty with somebody, but they're not. How can we fix this? Because they got to go to settlement and you found legitimate evidence. It sells itself. You don't have to sell it. Do the right thing. But you have to talk to them. Advise them. Be a consultant to them on that case. Make sure the graph is entered correctly. Make sure damages are indi indicated directly, correctly. And, and, and where it's at. Make sure you've listed all of it. If there's a well on the property, you have to note where the well is. You have to note where it enters the house. And you have to note the linear footage between it. That's the, that is agricultural law. That is the law. If you don't do it, it's a violation. Make sure you photo areas and include the attic and uh, obstructed areas that like clutter conditions. If they ask questions on treatment, you are free to engage. Once you tell them what the problem is, and they say, well, what do we got to do to treat it? Then you can engage them. By telling them how to treat, and because it has a price to it, doesn't mean you're selling it. It just means you're reporting it. They've asked for it. That's when you do it. It works, trust me. If you report damages, make sure you re report all damages that you see. Don't just stop and try to prosecute a case and think that's all there is to it. And then they got damages in another area. You're going to be liable for that. If no one is present, you did a lockbox. This is the biggest sin that you can make. Make the damn call. Why would you do all that and not call the realtor or whoever ordered the report and not call them? Oh, well, let me guess. You do call them when it's bad. So that means every time they pick up their phone, they see it's you. Well, I wouldn't want to hear from you. You have to make the call on every inspection so they get used to hearing your voice, your name, when it's good more than it is when it's bad. If you don't do that, I'd like to say you're an idiot. But I'm going to be nice and say you're just stupid. That's not the way to do business. I try to be nice in these things. But if you're not calling the agent after every inspection, that's dumb. Do your job. It's a great industry. Make sure you take care of the customer. Make sure you take care of uh, the company. But more importantly, take, make sure you take care of yourself. You're a professional. So take your exam. Let's see how you do.